So one of the first lessons in law school, and also something that they gave us from the conference as speakers, is you have to number your points. <laughs> five points, five minutes. Um, oh, but here's the pre-point. I think we should think about it also. <laughs> Um, a lot of websites, our, our, our core website is don'tgetrolled.org for more information for public citizens, mm -hmm. but as well the stuff at Free Speech for People and others. Okay, point number one. What was the meaning, what was the holding of this decision, what's sort of the broader meaning? John alluded to this. So, the actual issue in this case was, was actually pretty narrow. The holding was, was very broad, as John said. The holding is that corporations have a First Amendment right to spend whatever amount they want out of their own treasuries to influence election outcomes. But it was actually broader, more egregious, and more aggressive than that sounds. That should strike you as pretty remarkable. To read the decision is to read an incredible ode to the First Amendment. The, the majority really appreciates the value of the First Amendment. For example, the government has muffled the voices that best represent the most significant segments of the economy. And they go on to explain how the First Amendment is so important for people to express Minorities and minority views to express their core innermost feelings. It's very moving until you realize the people that they're talking about are Exxon and BP. That muffled voice, that was BP's voice that they're talking about in this decision in which they're trying to liberate. I think and that it is rooted in the First Amendment and not in just some statutory interpretation means um, both that we can't overturn the statute, very important but also that it has a much broader cultural resonance and much more uh, broader cultural importance. It's the centerpiece of our Constitution, the First Amendment, and it is going to enact a cultural change in what corporations do in spending in elections, which is going to take place, I think, unfold over time. Not all at once, but going to get much pro progressively much worse. Okay, second point, some interesting numbers, some of which have been mentioned in, in different forms. In the 2007-2008 federal election cycle, $5.2 billion spent by all candidates for office. Exxon's profits in that same two-year period were $85 billion. Pfizer made $27 billion in sales from Lipitor during that period. Goldman Sachs spent last year $16.5 billion on executive compensation. So a lot of money available from the corporate side to come in if they choose to do it, as I, as I think they will over time. Other interesting numbers. American Crossroads, which is Carl Rove's new effort to have a parallel Republican National Committee, aims to raise $50 million this year to spend on elections, or for sure you'll succeed and probably see that number. The Chamber of Commerce, which is already a third party in American politics, is going to spend at least $50 million, according to their own public statements, to influence the election outcomes. Americans for Prosperity, which is a front group funded by I don't know who, is just going to spend also $50 million. American Action Network, is aiming for only $25 million. The Club for Growth, which is kind of a right-wing lunatic free libertarian thing, and I spent $24 million. All this stuff is kind of brewing before Citizens United, but is now going to go on at a different level with, much, with access to different pools of money. Corporations have far, far, far more money than Bill Gates has or than George Soros has. It's not comparable. Rich, people, rich individual people, as much money as they have, as much as they might spend, as much as they might mess up the system, have nowhere near the money as corporations do. Corporations exist to make money, and they do it, and they have a lot of money. To spend. They spent a small portion of it on politics. Really good investment, as Lisa said, um, for really bad policy outcomes. Third point, are what are the scenarios in which this stuff might take place? Well, the first thing is that the companies themselves are not likely to spend tons of money directly on campaigns. What they're likely to do is run the money through front groups and trade associations like the Chamber, um, or things like, with names like Americans for Prosperity, or Americans for Truth, or Americans for Good Ideas, or Americans for Happiness, or Americans for Joy, and so on. <laughs> and that's already happening. That's going to happen to a greater extent. That's kind of the sort of big picture federal level. I think we're also going to see uh, individual candidates being targeted. We're going to see industries that we're going to see industries take play um, that are politically active spend a lot more money. Like pharmaceuticals are one of the big ones. Defense is another big one. Oil another big one. Wall Street another big one. Um, they're going to they're going to channel out money these ways. Uh, but we're going to see individual candidates targeted who take on industries, and that's going to happen even more at the state and local level than it happens at the federal level. So you're going to see the, 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 the woman who stood up and denied the permit to the mine in the state or went after the company for pollution, that person is going to be targeted. And they're likely going to be defeated because they're not going to be able to raise comparable amounts of money. And then the last, sort of, in some ways, worst um, aspect of this is once that happens a few times, 
Everybody knows it happens all the time. So they don't have to keep doing it. They've actually chilled everybody across the country. Not only have they chilled everybody who's an elected official, they've chilled people who were thinking about running for Congress or thinking about running for city council or thinking about running for the state legislature because why do it? Right? Why get elected if you can't do anything except be defeated if you try to do something? So this, the scenarios are pretty dire. And uh, I think they're likely to unfold. More likely than not. Totally. But I think it's going to happen that way. Fourth point is solutions. I think there's a range of things that we can do, some of which this Lisa is going to talk about that are legislative. Um, there's also the, the you know, fundamental important effort to get public financing and public elections led right now through the Fair Elections Now Act. Um, but if you look at this decision, it requires a constitutional amendment to overturn it. Uh, you can't go around the edges of it. It is a very broad decision, and there's no way to work to be clever. You can't wordsmith around it. It just says you can't limit corporate spending, basically. So if you care about limiting corporate spending on elections, you have to overturn this decision. There's a very interesting discussion that we had about the details of how we do that, and we don't have all, we're not all the shared view on that. Um, it's actually, I think, actually interesting and not totally obvious what the right answers are. Um, but the most important thing is to get agreement for an amendment to overturn the decision. Our view, um, as John was expressing, is to really focus on the First Amendment and specify that corporations don't have rights under the First Amendment with the exception of freedom of press. Um, the last fifth point is that there are, and this relates to some of the stuff that Lisa was talking about, and the importance of taking on this fight, is that there are synergies involved in running a constitutional amendment campaign. So we can be, we can pound the table, I didn't pound them, so we can pound the table, and the mics are really good, so that makes you guys happy. We can pound the table, and as we should, and emphasize that we have to do this, that is a moral imperative, but you have to, we also have to deal with a pragmatic concern, and we'll, Maybe it's really bad, but maybe it's also really crazy and therefore not a good idea. Um, it's not crazy. I'm with John and Lisa. We are not doing this as, a, as an exercise and showmanship. We think it's actually achievable and that we can win. But it's also important to be honest that it's an uphill fight. It's a really hard thing. And I think what gives us reason to engage in it nonetheless is that even as we go in this long-term campaign, recognizing that we might not win, I think running this campaign has really, really positive synergistic benefits. I think running this campaign is the best hope for ultimately achieving public financing and public elections. Um, and I think it has all kinds of positive ancillary benefits for corporate campaigns and politics in general. This issue squarely and without confusion confronts, you know, presents the question, too much corporate power, not enough corporate power. Do you think corporations should control our democracy? Do you think people should control our democracy? What is democracy? Is it ruled by corporations or is it rule of the people. Not surprisingly, the people overwhelmingly agree with us. It is rule of the people. It is not rule of the corporations. And even a vast majority of Republicans agree with us. This was a bad decision. So this is an excellent terrain for us to fight on. It frames everything else really well, including elections, including every kind of corporate campaign we work on, including work on Wall Street reform, including work on health care reform, including environmental fights, on down the line. So I think this is one that we all should be engaged in, again, on, on whatever issue is kind of your core thing, or whether you just want to carry forward a progressive agenda. I think this, is a, this needs to be the center, and it works, not just because it's important, but it frames things right for everything else we want to work on. Thanks.